good afternoon and welcome. This is a very special uh, moment for many of us uh, because uh, we are here for the public launch uh, of uh, the book by uh, Yehuda Elkana and Hannes Klopper on the universities in the 21st century. As many of you know, the original manuscript was prepared in English by uh, Yehuda and Hannes, but it was only published in German. And then an unfinished uh, English version continued to circulate and many people were asking from uh, many places, many other universities, what is happening to that manuscript? Is it going to become a book or not? And finally, it is a book. It's just coming out from the press. It was uh, finalized uh, last week. So I'm not going to talk uh, about the book. Uh, I will leave this task to um, uh, Hannes, uh, one of the co-authors, and uh, two colleagues, most of you know them uh, well. Uh, Marvin Lazarson is a professor at CU, Professor Emeritus at the University of Pennsylvania, and he is the chair of the Internationally Advisory Committee of the Yehuda Elkana Center for Higher Education. And uh, Jor Ritzen is the founder of Empower European Universities, uh, former uh, rector of Maastricht universities and uh, one, someone who has done a lot in higher education and for higher education in Europe and outside Europe over the last several decades. So I'd like to thank um, all of you for, for being here. I uh, do owe special thanks to Marvin Lazarson because he edited, uh, he took over the task of editing that unfinished uh, English manuscript and this was uh, a lot of work over more than a year, probably closer to two years. Marvin will talk, I believe, a little bit uh, about that and I'm not sure we would have had a book today with, without him, so thank you very much, uh, Marvin. I would also like to uh, acknowledge uh, Yehudi Telkana, who is uh, here with us, and uh, thank you very much for, for being with us, uh, um, Yehudi. Uh, we will have a short, uh, I hope short, uh, rather short, um, talks by uh, Marvin Yo, and then we would leave uh, Hannes as the co-author at the end. And um, you know, after these talks, uh, you will have a chance to make comments or, or ask uh, questions from the author, co-author, or from the uh, two members of the panel. If you want to ask questions from Yehuda, you are free to do it. Well, we don't have a working email address for him, unfortunately. Uh, we had his picture on the, on the wall in the morning. This is the, the cover of... Uh, of his book, but you know, he might be here in, uh, in some way, who knows. So Marvin. Uh, I suspect Yehuda is here. He's been with me for 18 months now on a daily basis. Um, Yehuda, Yehuda Akana's professional identity uh, combined intellectual depth with uh, pragmatic behavior in order to get things done. And as many of you in the know, in the room now, uh, know better than I, he was also passionate and impatient, uh, which made him both wonderful to be with and difficult to be with at the same time. Um, it comes as no surprise, certainly didn't to me, that this book co-authored with Hannes Klopa manifests all of these characteristics, intellectual depth, uh, and patient pragmatism uh, and passion. Um, early on when I took on this task of editing the book, I, I had a couple of email exchanges with Hannes uh, because I, I, did, I literally didn't know what to do. I, after all, edited lots of you know, doctoral dissertations, books, my own books, etc. cetera. Um, but I was struggling with this one and um, so I said, well, what's, what's the issues here, Hannes, and uh, um, uh, give me some insight. Uh, I have some ideas what the issues are, but, but give me your, vision, your version of it at, as, uh, as you and Yehuda talked. And Hannes said, um, look, at the, um, Yehuda always saw this, as a, this book as a set of normative essays 
Each essay could be read independent of one another, mulled on, argued with, etc. Um, uh, and the book's too long, the manuscript's too long. Well, the fact was that that's exactly what I had concluded on my, you know, second or third reading of, uh, of this thing. Um, on the normative essays side, um, uh, the reader could choose from a multiplicity of topics. Uh, the evolving idea and purposes of the university, the need for curricular form, what that meant, the importance of rhetoric and education. And by rhetoric, Yehuda painfully uh, tries to tell us that rhetoric involves not just kind of talking uh, the way um, debaters do, but how you put together uh, your ideas, what you know, how you make meaning of those ideas or what you know, and then how you communicate it. That is, rhetoric is an intricate and complex process that can be learned. Um, he has chapters, they have chapters on the challenges facing the disciplines, on transforming the relationship between research and teaching, on pragmatism as an appropriate philosophy of education, uh, a brilliant chapter actually on the history of pragmatism, uh, and chapters on the revolutionary impact of digitalization on education. So it was reasonable and remains reasonable to treat this book as a series of semi-autonomous um, uh, essays. Uh, but as a book writer myself, I, I found this very, very unsatisfactory um, uh, because it lacked the powerful message that I knew was there. I wasn't sure what it was, but I knew it was there. Uh, and um, taking a page out of Yehuda, uh, I believe that these essays, that this book was more than the sum of the individual parts. Uh, and, and my task as an editor was not simply to move words around, but to figure out what that summation was. Um, to do this, I started from the, almost the first day I got the original manuscript, um, an almost daily conversation with Yehuda Elkana. Um, uh, sometimes um, companionable, sometimes full of strife, sometimes furious at me, sometimes believing he was uh, angry, uh, at, furious at him, sometimes believing he was angry at me, et cetera. But I can say, before I go to the content of this discussion, um, uh, my days and nights with Yehuda were um, one, of, uh, one of the most um, rewarding intellectual journey uh, I have ever been on. It, it, um, so anybody who thanks me for um, editing this book, I can only say that, uh, that um, Yehuda and Hannes have used pressure um, on me, um, you know, gave me an opportunity that, uh, that I had never, uh, never experienced before. So with that said, I had to figure out um, where was, uh, you, where did Yehuda and Hannes come out? Now, at first, this conversation with Yehuda was, was complex, was difficult. Uh, difficult was an understatement. It was almost impossible um, because Yehuda was a complex person and a complex scholar. Uh, and he knew a lot more than I did about most things. Um, but we also differed in very fundamental ways. You know, Yehuda was really an intellectual. Whatever his role here as a leader, and as a, pro as a uh, rector and president, um, or as a head of uh, institutes, he, was, he really was a, an intellectual. And his writing style was what I would call kind of Germanic intellectualism. And that is, he circled around topics, uh, went around and around. Every paragraph had multiple ideas, multiple themes, multiple points of view, multiple footnotes. Um, and uh, uh, it, it, this meant, that, and this often result, by the way, in single sentences. Um, this meant that he could package into a paragraph more than most people can produce in 20 to 30 pages of text. Uh, that which was fine, intellectually rewarding, um, but it, 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 it was totally at odds with the way I approach writing. Um, I tend to write like a journalist. Uh, some of my critics often say I write more like uh, you know, a fiction writer, but that's a different, uh, different discussion. I write like a journalist, and I assume 
that uh, by the end of the first paragraph of whatever I write, I will have lost half my readers. That will continue uh, through the rest of the text so that if the text is long enough, I wind up with less than one person still reading. Um, this produced, as you can imagine, a number of clashes. And um, actually, I'm thankful uh, that it was a one-sided conversation in this case. Um, Yehuda also believed, another fundamental difference between the two of us, uh, he believed in Isaac Newton's famous phrase that he stood on the shoulders of giants. This, by the way, is a title of a famous book by the sociologist Robert Merton on, sh on the shoulders of giants that was published in the uh, mid-1960s, 1965. Um, what this amounted to for Yehuda was something more than just you know, citing these people or offering commentary footnotes. This resulted in his commitment, passionate commitment, to give due recognition to every one of the giants whose shoulders he stood on, including a lot of not so big giants. Um, this led to multiple pages of interpretation of what something uh, someone had read whenever. Uh, often multiple people, multiple interpretations, pages after page. I was at the American school uh, um, that said, just tell your story, acknowledge others, you know, a couple of footnotes here, citation there, but stay focused on what you wanted to say. So this, produced, this, this, this series of things produced a certain amount of strife, and uh, we compromised, uh, I compromised, with the hope that Yehuda would agree with what I was doing. Um, and then I turned to the overriding picture. And this is what Yehuda and Hannes argue. The Western Enlightenment uh, cluster of values around knowledge, the views of what knowledge was, that, that took heart, that took, that, that, that took off, I mean, it, was, it predated the late 17th and, and 18th centuries, but that assumed power in the seventh, late, eight, late 17th and 18th centuries, assumed that knowledge was rational, that it was all embracing, that knowledge evolved in an orderly, linear, and predictable way, that it could be measured, and that it could be made certain. Knowledge in this cluster of values was context dependent, independent, and therefore it was always applicable and relevant. If it was true in one place at one time, it was going to be true in other places at other times. Um, and that is, there was a truth to be learned. These values were the basis of the widely accepted notion of a scientific revolution. Um, and as the book argues, uh, they, they, these values helped the West achieve remarkable economic, technological, scientific, and social success well into the 20th century. In this context, universities were critical. They were both the important beneficiaries of this cluster of values, and they were contributors to the very success of the values. The values about knowledge supported the notion of scientific research. It supported the growth of academic disciplines and the development of a professoriate that claims supremacy in the ongoing search for truth and in the creation of a language of science. These accomplishments, uh, Yehuda and Hannes argue, um, were nothing short of sensational, and they should be given due credence. So, what more is there to say? The next step is where the shoe falls. The essential and controversial argument of this book is that the cluster of enlightenment values with regard to knowledge has exhausted itself. Indeed, if it's left unchallenged, this cluster, it stands as an obstacle to understanding the world of the 21st century. And if it's left unchallenged by universities, they, universities, will sink into irrelevance. Uncertainty, messiness, unpredictab unpredictability, Nonlinear discoveries, context dependencies are today, and increasingly so tomorrow, the nature of knowledge. Traditional dichotomies that we have been living with for centuries in the West 
between theoretical and basic research on the one hand and technical and applied research on the other have to be rejected. The dichotomy between professional and liberal education has to be thrown out. The dichotomy between theory and practice have to be replaced by overlapping and engaged engagements uh, in which the goals are to find resolutions to shared intellectual, social, economic, technological, and political problems. That is, these um, uh, these, these silos within universities, between universities and the outside world, simply have to be torn down. Universities have to accept the fact that the digital revolution changes the ways we learn, the ways we think, the ways we share knowledge, the ways we make decisions. Let me add one other point. You know, for those of, uh, I think most of you in this room uh, knew Yehuda, uh, many of you knew him better than I did. Um, Yehuda was, you know, Yehuda was a, a, a traditionalist in many ways. That, at the, that, it, that in this process of being engaged with universities and his time at CEU and, and before, that he would move to such a radical position. Some of you will have to tell me whether that was predictable or not. Uh, you, did, you may know, but for me, um, uh, it was something of a surprise. He, he pushed further than I would have anticipated him pushing. Now, uh, Hannes and Yehuda give numerous concrete examples of what they mean, including the way some institutions around the world are changing in response to the new environment of knowledge. The core of these efforts is and should be to make the case that the preparation of knowledgeable, thoughtful, and engaged citizens has to be the essential overriding goal of universities. Okay, that's all pretty abstract, I know. It's, it's, ele it's more elegantly written than I have put it together and much more complicated. Um, so, but, but to kind of um, solidify it, I want to offer three examples from the book to illustrate uh, what this means. First, there's a proposal for a first year curriculum required of every first year student in every university in the world, composed of courses in academic disciplines and, and uh, small interdisciplinary seminars that treat the existential problems that confront the world today. His argument, or their argument, is that an, an academic discipline is one of the best ways, and, and by this he also includes this interdisciplinary notion, as long as it's become a true discipline as opposed to the, one of these, you know, smorgasbords of uh, buffets of uh, discipline here, discipline there, with no real discipline anywhere. Um, uh, the, the, an academic discipline is a necessary condition for, obviously, discipline, learning, and thinking. It frames the ability to think deeply. It gives one methodology, a methodology or methodologies with which to pursue knowledge. But in this, these courses, the academic discipline not only has to explain what it knows, it has to highlight the challenges facing the discipline the open questions, the uncertainties that face every discipline, including the limits of its knowledge. That is, every course that works within an academic discipline has to also show why the discipline is insufficient to answer most of life's questions. The interdisciplinary seminars taught in small groups, on the other hand, will ask students to grapple directly with humanity's great struggles, hunger, poverty, public health, sustainability, climate change, security, and water resources. Those of you who are here for the panelists uh, earlier this afternoon will recognize um, uh, the, work, um, the work already being done uh, on, uh, in putting these ideas uh, into practice. The essential point, though, is that the first year of university education should focus simultaneously on discipline learning and humanity's great challenge. This is the start of an education for citizenship. Second example, Elkanah and Klopa, Klopa call for a radical reversal of the current value placed on research and teaching. They are scathingly critical of the iconic status of research 
with almost every university calling itself a research university or on the way to becoming a research university. It's time to acknowledge that few professors actually do serious research. It's time to acknowledge that little is published uh, that is valuable, little, that little that is published is valuable outside of a group of scholars. And even here, when it's directed at this limited number of scholars, very few of the scholars themselves actually read the work being published in their field. The time, the energy, and money would be better spent in teaching and learning, in smaller classes, more teaching, and mentoring time for professors who no longer have to make believe or pretend that they are serious researchers. Third, this will require, obviously, substantial improvement in the conditions of status of teaching. As they write, in order to establish teaching professors, that is, those people who voluntarily choose to be teaching professors uh, and who may be doing some research, who may be doing clinical work, who may be trying to make new meaning out of existing uh, scholarly findings, um, these teaching professors have to be considered equals to researchers in terms of social prestige. They must have the same salary scale, the same promotion procedures, the same academic perks, sabbaticals, tenure, library, and computer access, and relevant budgets. The final example is even more sweeping than the two I mentioned. The digital revolution has altered almost everything we have taken for granted about knowledge. Universities, as I mentioned, are the great beneficiary and contributed to the enlightenment values that are today threatened or exhausted. These values are being swept away by a new enlightenment in which information and knowledge are being created, shared, revised, and being acted upon in bewildering quantities, in bewildering speed, and with enormous consequences. The last two chapters of the university in the 21st century are devoting to describing what has been happening and what should be done. The basic message is, if universities think they can ride this wave out by patching a little here and a little there, by creating, online, uh, by creating a few online courses or joining a platform that offers such courses, by putting course content and inserting online chats into their course structure, or by treating social networks as if they were simply social gatherings online, they better wake up because their monopoly on knowledge has ended. There is, of course, much more to this book um, as befitting Yehuda's style. Uh, every chapter has multiple insights into multiple phenomena spread across time, space, and fields of study. Yehuda, with Hannes' help, has added to a legacy that he had already given many of us. More personally, as I started, Yehuda gave me the a gift of an extraordinary intellectual journey over many months that still continues. And for that, Yehuda, I thank you. Thank you so much for having me invited, uh, Livio, because I really consider this to be a tremendous privilege and honor to talk about Yehuda in the context of his thoughts as they have been so nicely laid down in this book. And you mentioned how much, say, agony it costed to put Yehuda in perspective, because indeed it is a complex book. And the first thing um, you said was, and that's actually not clear when you read the book, uh, but I also wrote this down as the first, this is a book about what should. So when you read the book, it's in a way very nicely taking you along different avenues on complexity, uncertainty, doctoral education, different places, and never actually, it is said, it should be different. So there is sometimes criticism on that path or on that path. And I think it's important indeed to realize that this is a book about what should. Um, um, of course, maybe I'm doing injustice because the background is, say, somewhat, uh, it's very well built up, but once again, the normative is very important. Thank you very much, for Marvin, for starting with saying with that, because I felt a bit unsure about saying that. Um, and then, in my economist language, I would say it is indeed about adding value uh, in competencies, in attitudes, in behavioral characteristics of students. 
So it is about teaching. And I think that comes through very strongly in everything he says. And of course then, indeed, in that context of complexity, I think also cultural understanding, cross-cultural understanding, um, and also maybe, and that's a bit on a sliding scale, for understanding the need for humanism. It's, I think it is something which is, um, as an economist, you like to measure it, you like to put your fingers on it, and it, this is, doesn't come so strongly through in something you get your hands on, but I believe that that um, description, understanding the need for humanism, is important. The one thing which I also very much looked at is this doesn't apply, so there are many humanists here, or human scientists here, but he actually doesn't address just the human sciences. He looks at this very much as part of the sciences as a whole. And I think, that in a way, uh, I would say to him, if he were sitting there, I would say, why didn't you make that somewhat more elaborate? Um, and myself, I've had this experience of having been trained as uh, a physicist, and at that time, recognizing, uh, while, by the way, being very heavily involved already in the council as a student, um, recognizing that we were very much trained in isolation without the background and without the context in which an engineer, a physics engineer, works. And then very much coming to a conclusion that we needed far more within the curriculum, uh, far more attention to philosophy, uh, questions of integrity, uh, morality, and in fact that has happened, so in that respect I'm pretty happy with the way in which um, some of the thoughts uh, of Yoda were already taken up in some directions in uh, European uh, science training. So, um, but I think the most important part, I think, for from his considerations are um, the humanities have a much larger role to play than at themselves. They are very much part of a broader body of science. Now, um, if you read the book, you can find references to this in terms of the integrative or the interdisciplinary, where, which are two terms at some point Yuda says in the book. I don't like the word interdisciplinary because that is overloading students, so I prefer the term integrative. So, uh, on the normative, um, so there is some reasoning around it, but it's not a reasoning which is in many respects compelling. And sometimes I feel that he does injustice to himself by not um, explaining or going deep enough in terms of the background of humanism in the sense of human rights, uh, in terms of uh, the value of democracy, fundamental truth. Um, of course, there is quite a bit of uh, there is quite a bit of things you can say to those notions, particularly in terms of uncertainty. And this I very much put against the background of Gödel um, impossibility theorem that these indeed may be truth even if you can't prove them. But I think in some parts you would like very much to think about human rights as not just a religion, uh, a new religion. It's something which is deeper uh, than that. It's something which can be encompassed. Then the question on, um, for me on the uh, extent to uh, which higher education and education at large can help to develop commitment of youngsters, students, to human rights and uh, humanism uh, in general, and also the way in which you would want to construct a university. Uh, um, we also had some thoughts about that in the sense of sometimes the notion of networks came up, and uh, I wanted to make a comment there, which is very much also linked to the book. I do believe that the way in which the university is constructed in the mind of uh, Yehuda, as he put it down here, is a community, and not a network. A community is different from a network. A community is alive, shares emotions, shares meetings which go beyond the exchange of formal information. And that is where I feel also more thought should be put to. Um, 
and also where you would like to develop more the notions of how technology can indeed contribute to that or what are the limits also of technology in terms of I would say the community and the emotional and by the way there are, my background was similar to yours I was also a member uh, of the student council at an early age dealing with uh, f topics in physics which I uh, just had understood or not had understood with all these famous professors. Now, I still look back at that uh, in the sense of a learning experience for me. So, in that respect, I would like, like very much to involve students always in policy also in universities, of course within their own area, in the teaching and learning in their own area, um, but also broader in university leadership in the sense, of course, these are selected students who want to make the time, but just to give them also part of that experience. It's like uh, being involved, indeed, in the larger experience of being part of a community and how that community develops. Uh, so then the question, what kind of undergraduate education is suitable for the cultivation of democratic citizenship? Um, now, on page 172, you would have said something which I would have disagreed with. If he would have been here, I would say, you that, this is ridiculous. He says, this is a philosophical issue. And I would have said, no, you that, this is really an empirical issue. That's, we have to look at the way in which we do that. And even maybe not measuring it in some uh, degree with a scale and with, uh, say, numbers attached to it, but generally looking at, and we do have indeed many experiments in this direction, where some experiments show indeed that there is much more of a commitment also to be found back later in life in terms of uh, citizenship compared to other experiences. And I used here also earlier the, uh, what was for me really something quite surprising, that German students who enter with quite a strong altruistic feeling turn out having studied economics to become less altruistic, um, while in many other uh, of the so-called ocean skills, the big five, uh, that is openness, that's attentiveness, that's also uh, uh, stability, extrovert, introvert, um, conscientiousness, that those are the ocean skills, there is not that much of a change. But in altruism, you find that strongly back. By the way, um, on risk-taking, um, creativity, also there is a lot of change, but pretty much throughout education, that's also even in primary and secondary education, negative. So this is something which I think confirms our feelings that the school teaches you uh, to be particularly to restrict yourself and of course that was never meant to be the case but so this is taking it from the philosophical notion to an empirical notion I, I think this is something also which needs further elaboration important of course is his contribution on doctoral education um, I think everything he says on this has been saying about that for about some 15 years I think is true and at the same time um, there is this question why it hasn't changed, um, because there was very little change. When um, I look at my own experiences, um, I had a meeting not so long ago with uh, five of my PhD graduates, uh, which are supervised in the 1980s. Um, so this was a long time ago. They had had a career, and after that career, I invited them at home, we had a nice meal, and I asked them, so what did the PhD mean for you? And this was so interesting because it's very much along the line uh, of what Yehuda wants to change. Um, uh, the people who went into academia did very well. Also said, all of them said, great intellectual experience. Of course, they couldn't say much different when they met their former supervisor. Um, but um, then the guy who went to the Ministry of Finance said, actually, it was held against me. They always looked at me like, you are making the problems larger than they are. And actually felt that his promotion was actually not served by having had the PhD. And after a while, he stopped using the PhD uh, in his name. Very interesting. Maybe that's just the Dutch Ministry of Finance. But I fear that that is maybe more general. Um, 
Other people were a bit in between. People who went into business uh, found out it had been helpful, but, well, not too helpful. So, Judas' point is we should uh, have the PhD for training people for leadership in society. Is that working? Didn't work for my group, but that's maybe just a small selection. But then I look at the way in which universities, also in Europe, have tremendously increased in the number of PhDs. And also reflecting on the way in which we did that in Maastricht, we had many discussions on this. And I'm not so sure whether, indeed, professors are skilled enough, have been really uh, through this experience that people should be trained for life and not just for academia. So in Maastricht we do this by requiring the supervisor and also the student one year ahead of the promotion to the PhD final exam to make sure that there is a relationship with the labor market. So you have to look early on because if you wait until the PhD is completed then it's, I mean, there will be a long period of unemployment possibly. Um, but um, it is a very tedious process and still I notice that it's very difficult for um, students to, get, to go outside of the university and look for work there. So in that respect I, I do feel that his uh, dedication to PhD training, doctoral uh, uh, learning, that that is still something to be um, uh, implemented. Now, in the book, uh, Hannes has contributed a great deal on uh, technology and the use of technology. And I'm going to make a couple of remarks on that. First of all, I like his approach that it is about learning. And I mean, that is very much in the line, and I hope that also, or I assume that there has been also some, uh, some thinking with uh, Yehuda on this. Um, of course, pervasive for Yehuda has always been the university is about student learning. And of course, the research comes in, but uh, that is something which should not take the focus away from learning. So also technology is not about anything special, but it's about learning. And, then the one thing which uh, you do also mention, but only say in between, is humanistic learning in a broader context. That is something I think we should build in terms of um, thinking about the legacy of Yehuda uh, further build on. So technology comes quite often in simply as learning in the old way. I would say in Yehuda's words, according to the old curriculum. Well, particularly Yehuda always says, well, think about the curriculum. The curriculum should be rich, should be for a new world, the new enlightenment. Does technology help there? Um, it, it, in a way, I think there is not yet fully uh, the match. I think it can be done, but it is not something uh, where I'm sure of. Um, it does relate also to another point which um, Actually, Yuda in his book says at the beginning, or Marvin, you wrote it down that way, and, um, an interesting quote. Higher education cannot be paid for by governments. Private sector and open education resources important role in providing new high quality offerings at low costs. So that's going to be the solution. Is that the case? Um, first of all, why wouldn't governments be able to pay for it? And what should governments be paying for? I believe that every person has a right on high quality education, equality of opportunity for everyone, as an investment in the future. If, if it's high quality, if it indeed leads to a, the kinds of developments in the person, the talents, in a way in which those would be applicable in society in whatever way. It can be in politics, it can be on the labor market, it can be in all kinds of ways. So, then it's an investment, and then actually no investment is, the investment will have a return. Now there is another question on how to distribute the costs between the person who participates um, and uh, government. So there is the government role. But to say that the government cannot pay for something which has a high return, it's like um, the individuals can't pay to buy a car, because, I mean, it's costly, huh? 
So, and the cars have become more costly because they are more esoteric, while they actually have become less costly. But, so, I think that argument doesn't really apply. Now, here is the question of what is government? Um, uh, is government the one which makes it possible for students to have loans or to have all kinds of possibilities? And also, what are the real costs for quality education? I very strongly believe that, well, in the US sometimes I feel that it's um, not in line. Also in Denmark, um, and this is not something I say from uh, the top of my head, but when you look at educational investments uh, and returns in uh, PIAC, that is Project International Assessment of Adult Qualities, um, competencies, then you notice that, for example, a country like also Denmark may have too high costs in the sense that return is lower. But those are really also very expensive. When you look at other countries, they are far below what should be done in terms of costs. So I think that debate should still be um, addressed. Also the debate on technology and costs. Um, you addressed that also in your presentation, and that's throughout the book. Uh, I'm not so sure about the way in which uh, the costs for, uh, are going to be reduced. I think that something can be done in terms of increasing the quality. Well, and that's almost saying the same that you might uh, use technology to add on to um, the provision of uh, higher education in a way in which you raise the quality and in that way you have extra costs. And here also then the point of implementation. So, in a way, I don't understand why you would see Microsoft as a, um, a, a competitor. Uh, let them go, please. Uh, and if they do better in terms of providing, say, the social value added in competencies, I mean, marvelous if someone else pays for it. And indeed, someone also remarked here in the public that um, that is not so likely with the example that not only the bankers uh, learning. Actually, the industries have always developed, first of all, their own in-service learning and then put it out to the public. Even primary education quite often was something which was done by companies. And then, of course, as soon as the possibilities arose, went to the public. Um, but So maybe continuing on the point of um, change. Change um, in terms of governance, um, and change also in terms of introducing technology. And EULA asks for change. So it's clear, so that's the normative, what we do now is not good. Um, of course, it is very much based on something, and I'm interpreting now EULA, because we have too much um, relied on notions of excellence based on research. And of course, that is, when that is measured, you turn into the wrong alley. Because then, of course, you're going to strive. I saw that in Korea, where one of the uh, rectors of the university said, within five years, we will be among the top 100 universities. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, in Maastricht, we never thought about the rankings other than, well, that's a side event. We wanted very much to be there for education. Knowing that the rankings are used and are even used in parliament, but uh, well, you don't have to care too much about it if, as long as you're sure about that. That the fact that excellency in teaching does not count, in my view, has a lot to do with the fact that we don't have the measures. So that's why I always say from, we need to have a better measurement of educational output and even better um, value added in, uh, through education and through learning. Change. Um, how to accomplish this? I think that is something which is the next book of Yehuda, which he's not going to write uh, anymore, but I think that is the sequel to what has been uh, promoted now by uh, Yehuda and also by Hannes, in the sense of change, in the sense of coming to an agreement between the technology which is supply and between, uh, well, the demand for, from the education side for uh, technology. Change in terms of examples. Um, the, uh, there are examples in terms of how universities should be organized in Israel. Uh, you discussed that. 
um, were apparently the way in which that change was prepared uh, by an academic community didn't work because it did not bring, I think, the kind of, uh, say, uh, agreement on which you would like to work. I thought in the book there is this example of the American Association of Colleges and Universities, and that gives, I think, a very nice perspective. And it's also the perspective which I know Yoda relied a lot on in terms of um, an example of the main principles of his shoot. Where do we want to go as universities? Within the uh, universities, I've been dealing also a lot myself with this question of technology. And what I noticed there is that um, technology, introduction of technology, requires a tremendous innovation budget. Because for one or two years, you have to say to everyone, we stop with the way we are not working now, and we go over into a blended learning mode. Hmm? So that, that's actually what you have to do if you really are serious about that. So in that way, you better have it separate. But then if you have it separate, as the way you're doing it, Hannes, then you don't have the existing body and you don't have the blended learning. So the blended learning university is one, one still which has to be invented because there is not the money to make the changes in the university. There's not a university innovation budget. So how are universities run? I've looked at this a lot. Um, universities sometimes have an innovation budget. And what is the innovation budget for? It's always for research. There's hardly an innovation. So we were very proud in Maastricht. We had a five million innovation budget, which was less than 1% of the total budget. Um, and that was for education. And the 30 million, the 10%, more than, uh, no, almost 10% of the budget was for innovation and research. So this was the appropriation from the side of the leadership of the university, of course, in line with the deans in terms of renovating uh, or uh, building new research capacity. So um, I conclude here with particularly the way in which, if I may, um, the back page is constructed. I think, is, is the back page um, complete? Um, so it's the back page is... It's final, so we can't change it. So Novotny and Patricia Graham say, right, it is, this book is a plea for better education and that, of course, in coherence with research. Interesting. Um, SAYO has a matter statement. It's a, a statement, it's about analysis for implementation. Uh, Winkler, um, also very much on the education side, so this is the legacy. Then, um, and also Livio speaks very much uh, about that direction. I think there is something missing here, so the back page. Sorry for that. Uh, and that is, it is a must read for every university administrator because it is, uh, as was said this morning by Ignatiev, the rector here, it is for university administrators learning about what they don't know. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. And now if I may invite Hannes to tell us what really is in this book and how we should start you know, making up things that are not there. Okay, I'll spare you that. I won't uh, uh, give you yet another summary. I think we heard a lot. There are a few points I'd like to react to, but uh, before I do that, I, I'll give you uh, a quick story how this even came about because I think that's something that a lot of people are wondering about and, and that I'm being asked quite often is like, so how did this happen? Because, uh, yeah, Yehuda was uh, 50 years my elder, so uh, it wasn't that we've known each other from, you know, uh, the days when we were graduate students like uh, Mr. Ignatiev and, and you did. Um, uh, it came about quite differently. Um, actually, I was... Um, doing something quite different at the time. I was actually uh, working as a, as a consultant in online marketing and uh, had absolutely nothing to do with uh, academia, but I already knew at the time that you know, education was what I was interested in and uh, technology was, was something I was interested in. I somehow w wanted to bring the two together and I wasn't quite sure how I'd do that at the time. Um, but I you know, attended events and, and sort of dabbled in this and read here and there. Um, 
And so it happened that uh, Wilhelm Kroll, who unfortunately can't be here today, uh, gave a lecture at Humboldt University uh, talking about the future of the Bologna system in, in Europe. And uh, I went just you know, out of curiosity because I wanted to hear what he had to say. And there was an, a, a small reception afterwards where you know, all these dignitaries, uh, um, I think average age, I would say, was somewhere between 60 and 70. Be careful. <laughs> no, it's, uh, it's true. It's, it's true. Uh, um, and, and I stood there a little lost with my glass of champagne and sort of looking, uh, looking around. And then someone sort of shuffled through the crowd, hair everywhere, standing, you know, every direction. And he approached me and said, like, you're the only person here that doesn't have gray hair and you asked an intelligent question. Let's have lunch. <laughs> That's uh, that's how Yehuda introduced himself, and he gave me his card. Uh, and uh, a week or two later, we had lunch at Vico, um, the Wissenschaftskolleg, uh, and he told me about what he was up to and, and asked me what I was doing and what I was what I thought about it. And I said, well, it, it sounds great to me. Uh, he, he described, you know, the, how, that he wanted to write a book about how universities. Uh, you know, should rethink um, their curricula and, and how we should rethink undergraduate education. And I thought that sounds great, but the one aspect that I feel is missing is what is the impact of digital technology going to be in all this because uh, digital technology is changing the way we relate to other people and it's changing the way we deal with information. And those two things are very much at the heart of what universities do. You know, they they uh, let people engage with information and knowledge and they have let people engage with other people talking about information and knowledge and, and those those two core functions or aspects of, of what a university is are, uh, are very much you know enlarged by the possibilities uh, of digital technology and, and he said well that sounds great why don't you just you know write down for me what you think about that so I sat down and just wrote so from the top of my head some 10 pages uh, number of things that I uh, thought were relevant in this context and without even asking me uh, or, uh, he just sent that on to like a group of 15 people Helga Novotny and various others I hadn't even proofread it it was full of typos it's like okay that's embarrassing <laughs> and that's how we, we started to, to work together he invited me to join this curriculum group at Vico and so I went there every week and uh, um, for well, I don't know, um, half a year or so, at least we, we, we saw each other very frequently and, and had lunch. And uh, he also took me along when he went to Jacobs University and, and Lüneburg, uh, you know, for meetings to discuss the ideas that he had for the book. And one recurring theme that came, that, that, or reaction that he got time and again um, was, well, that's a nice idea, but it's an elite project, you know, like what you're suggesting there, it cannot be done in the context of a mass university. And, and that's actually, um, uh, you know, when it comes to this cost point uh, that uh, George has made, um, people saw that very, very critically. And they said, you know, you can't do Oxford for everybody. So it's nice that you want to do that, but, you know, how's it ever going to work? And it was actually through that discussion that we came back to it because, I mean, when you said uh, technology is necessarily more expensive, I mean, I do cite several people in the book, amongst them, uh, amongst them is Baun and uh, that group of people. I mean, they've shown in randomized control group experiments that you can do more with less in the context of existing mass universities already today with existing technology. So this is not me claiming this, I mean, there, there, there is some a body of literature on this at this point. So um, we came, uh, that's how we eventually came together that Yehuda said, okay, I want to write about the what, you know, what is it that university should go about teaching? And I, I said, okay, and I, maybe what I could bring to the table is, you know, how, the, how is the how of we, uh, the way we teach going to change uh, given the impact of technology and how can that change uh, you know, maybe facilitate um, uh, um, the, the delivery of this new way of uh, um, teaching people an, an undergraduate education at scale. And um, so, yeah, the idea of educating concerned citizens uh, shouldn't be an elite project. And uh, we came to an agreement that, that uh, technology can be one way of 
uh, enabling us to to delivering it to to everyone um, as you know as it should be in a democratic society where I think we all agree education should be available to uh, to all citizens and um, my starting point was very much the this thought experiment that Manfred mentioned it's also in, in the book or uh, when we originally published it there's this idea that it's given all of the possibilities of technology that have um, or you know, given everything that is now possible that wasn't possible when the model most universities operate on today were conceived, it seems unlikely that what we have and what we know today is the best we can do. You know, like there's there are so many new ways of doing things that have become available to, to us since the 19th century or even you know the middle of last century. Uh, that haven't really been incorporated yet. I mean, the, the email is the one thing that I think has really made it to general institutional practice. Uh, and maybe the video projector at this point, but that's about it. And, and microphones. I think those are like the, the three technological innovations that have really been seen wide adoption within the 20th century. Um, but there is so much more that is that is possible today. Uh, social media, online video, uh, video conferencing, but uh, it's it's really more about the, like um, it's not necessarily fancy technology, but uh, the right use of technology. So, for example, something like Facebook, it's essentially a website you can post things, but it's the way the usability is is the key that makes it something that is a global phenomenon and a, a website that's now being used more on a daily basis than any country in the world, uh, any, uh, you know, it's, it's a bigger country than any country in the world in terms of citizens, uh, if you will. So Facebook has more, more users, active users than China has citizens. So um, that was the starting point and um, yeah, we, uh, we argued that uh, it can help us, technology can help us to improve the overall teaching experience for everyone. So that is sort of the status quo teaching, if you will. But then I also do believe that uh, um, it can help us create the ex precisely the kind of courses that from an intellectual point of view, um, that we consider necessary from an intellectual point of view, that they can be created uh, using technology. So I think this the new enlightenment education that we call for um, is more easily implemented given the possibilities of technology. So for example, if you say, okay, this new enlightenment course should be multi-perspectival, interdisciplinary, um, you know, and, and, and then that is of course a lot easier to achieve in some sort of, in, in, be it an online or a blended format, but if you say, okay, you want to bring in students from all over the world online, a lot easier than if you sit somewhere, uh, you know, in, that's, I mean, of course, at the elite universities, it's, they are very international also, but it's all the same people from different countries, you know, <laughs> like they, they have very similar background. If you want pe diversity in terms of age, religion, work experience, and so on, all of that is a lot easier to achieve uh, in a digital context. Um, and then also, I believe, that the scalability of it uh, justifies a different kind of investment. The normal class is, okay, you have one instructor and he, ta uh, he or she, they take out uh, time to prepare for that course for, for a semester, but um, if you create courses that could be used by you know, many more people, um, and then locally adapted and, and maybe you, you know use the blended format so they are accompanied by an instructor on a local level uh, then you can, that justifies a, comp a very different kind of investment so uh, I think that's also that offers us a great opportunity to create the best possible course on climate change poverty terrorism you know the examples we mentioned earlier um, and uh, let people use that in many different locations and then create their own case studies that they can contribute uh, to the overall uh, to the overall course uh, and flushing out and improving it that way. So, um, I mean, Yehuda always said that the, the world is messy and complex uh, and these, uh, these new enlightenment values also challenged this idea that um, 
knowledge is sort of rigorous, dichotomous, um, and if you will, you could describe that perspective as, as analog, you know, like an analog signal is also kind of messy and complex and it's not as clear cut zero or one uh, as something that's digital. And um, so if you, if you see it that way, you could say the, the enlightenment um, knowledge that we have been teaching throughout the 20th century was rigorous and, and digital in a sense, whereas the, the kind of uh, perspective on knowledge that Yehuda thought we should use for teaching in the 21st century, the new enlightenment values, they are yeah more analog. There is uh, there there are what I, there are what's what I called earlier grayscale learning, yeah, where it's not about yes or no, zero or one, um, but you know I would do it be, uh, like this because I would do it like that because that is you know something that is is much more analog. And so you could say that we are moving from a world where we teach digital knowledge by analog means to a world where we teach analog knowledge by digital means, or using digital uh, means. And I think uh, that's, that shows of how the two perspectives uh, um, come together. That's the one that is one that comes, that grows out of the philosophy of science um, and the history of, uh, of science and, uh, and you know, the, this idea how um, we have to rethink our intellectual agenda how that uh, works together with this view of, you know, um, the, the many new possibilities that are afforded to us by di by digital technology, and yeah, that's that's kind of how we uh, we saw it, and, and that's how how we ended up writing this book. That is uh, an unusual collaboration, I guess. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannes. I don't know if there are any questions to Hannes or perhaps to Marvin and uh, you all. Uh, Yehuda didn't like long meetings. He <laughs> will or would have got impatient. <laughs> but if there are any? Well, I, um, I will just say a word a little bit in, uh, in reaction to what uh, you all said about the missing uh, part on the back cover. And I think he is right. I'm not sure whether anyone should say this is a must read for university administrators but, or policy makers in higher education, but it would be certainly useful. And I, uh, you know, I have thought a lot about the, the book recently. I read the manuscript originally. Yehuda himself sent it to me first. And I find it so surprising in, in, many, in many ways. I claim I knew Yehuda well, in particular his higher education part, although I have known him for a little over 10 years only. And I find this book so full of surprises. I won't uh, present a full list, but just one example. So this book is in a way a guidebook. It is both an intellectual guidebook and also practical or policy guidebook and it can be helpful to understand situation, challenges, developments in higher education and also to look for solutions. I'll give an example. He has a very interesting analysis of the crisis in the humanities that we keep uh, discussing and you know, to make this short he basically says the dominant narrative about the role of higher education nowadays shared by policymakers, parents, students, even by university people is the human capital narrative. The mission of universities is to help students gain human capital, which is skills, competences that have economic value. And then with this understanding comes the understanding that humanities don't have anything to contribute to uh, human capital. So if this, I think this is a very interesting analysis and then I have been asking myself, but then what's the solution? Well, theoretically and perhaps also practically, there are two solutions. One is to prove that humanities actually can contribute to human capital and they do and they should. But there is something even more interesting and I have been advocating this for a while. The role of the university should not be only to let students acquire human capital, but also social capital and we never talk about that. So that is, you know, help students to acquire, develop networks, 
social networks values to live with others. And I'm not going to, to, to discuss here how that is possible, but I think this should be a fundamental role of universities. And I, you know, I have thought about this while, while, uh, while reading uh, Yehuda, and I'm trying to put that in practice here at CEU, and I'm trying to convince others in, in other parts. So I, I take this from the, you know, the, the guidebook that this book is in a way both in an intellectual order and, uh, and uh, in a practical order. So uh, now I think I hear a voice saying, oh, really, enough. Uh, not yet enough. So, <laughs> Gabi, yes, please. That is this, that you talk about a high quality education, how you provide students with a high quality education. And I was trying to think in my mind, what is a high quality education? What is meant by that? And let me give you an example, which is, and I'm going to take my example from mathem theoretical mathematics. Namely this, that theoretical mathematics, for somebody who's going to be a professional theoretical mathematician, and for somebody who wants math to do economics, or math for computer sciences, is a completely different field. So that the higher education, the high quality education, provided for one consumer and for the other consumer has to be diverse. And that's the essence of the university. The essence of, essence of the university is the idea that high quality comes in many, many different guises and cannot be homogenized along one pattern, even if it's the same content that's being taught, let alone if you're talking about different content. Uh, yo, I won't let you answer unless you want to recommend Gabi a book or a link. I agree. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much to all of you. I would also like to thank CU Press. I am not sure Christina is here and, and as Peter is also here. I put a lot of pressure on them, I, I can tell you, to have the book out and have it out by this uh, uh, deadline. <laughs> good quality and it is there and they are still outside actually so if you don't have the book and would like to buy it it's a good investment i can recommend <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you.